this talk today is sponsored by the Secular Student Alliance, a nonprofit group that's based in Ohio, helped fund this, as well as the UC SC Provost Fund. So I want to thank the sponsors as well. And hey. before. And if everyone has a cell phone, maybe now turn off or like silence it, just a reminder for everyone. So the, our guest speaker today, Dr. Indra Viscontes, Indre Viscontes, is a scientist and artist, highly proficient in neuroscience and music. She has published more than 35 original research papers and book chapters on the neural basis of memory and creativity. As a musician, she curates, performs, and commissions vocal music as a leader of two ensembles, Opera on Tap, San Francisco, which brings opera to a wider audience in informal settings, and Vocalective, a collective of singers and instrumentalists dedicated to the art of vocal chamber music. Her talent for bringing complex scientific topics to a broad audience generated her international recognition as the scientific co-host of a six-hour docu-series called Miracle Detectives that aired on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Dr. Viscontes is affiliated with the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF, where she studies creativity and patience with dementia, and is a collegiate professor at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, where she teaches musicians how to apply the tenets of neuroscience to develop effective practice strategies. She's also an editor of journal Neurocase and a sought-after public speaker, as we have her today. She's also one of the hosts of the popular science and critical thinking podcast of Point of Inquiry. Some members of our group listen to this. Her ongoing collaborations include a project with internationally acclaimed installation artist Deborah Ashheim, highlighting the interplay between memory, creativity, and the brain, and a graphic novel about the brain with cartoonist and cultural critic M.G. Lord. Kind of say she's a Renaissance woman in many ways. Anyways, please give her a warm welcome and we'll let her go. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks very much to all of you for coming. Um, and I also want to thank Rob and Nick for having me in the Secular Student Alliance for hosting this evening and of course the UCSC Provost's office. So that's very kind. Thank you. Um, as you might have noticed, I have a rather unconventional background. Uh, so when I'm asked to give a talk, often you know the a topic is proposed to me. But when they leave it up to me, I like to talk about something that brings both of my obsessions together, and that is storytelling and how science can help us in understand our own behavior. So I hope you'll indulge me for the next hour as I sort of go through some of the fascinating things that um, show us how stories become have become a, a really integral part of the way that we think. Uh, and how we can make these stories better and more compelling. Uh, and finally, some speculation as to why stories are important in our lives and why they become such a big part of our lives. So let me first start off um, by saying something that you probably all know, especially if you're at all skeptical in nature, <coughs> is that uh, many of our senses are primed to see things that aren't there, to fill in gaps uh, where we don't have knowledge, and try to get a quick snap of the world so that we can behave uh, effectively. We don't want to have to try to analyze every little part of the world in order to make a decision, because there's just way too much information out there. So for example, our visual system is primed to see faces, uh, which are important to us, and we see them everywhere. Um, we animate what is inanimate if the stimulus is ambiguous, because mistaking a tree stump for a lion is less harmful to you than mistaking a lion for a tree, tree stump. This is called pareidolia. In the same way, we tend to spin stories out of events that we don't quite understand. Or when we're trying to learn or, or predict what someone is going to do next or what's going to happen next, we take a series of events and we infer a storyline from them. And then we try to use that story to predict what it is that's going to happen. But one of the things that is a, a sort of negative side of this kind of fascination towards either creating animate objects out of ambiguous stimuli or creating stories out of events is that sometimes um, we are biased towards false positives. So we see things that aren't there um, and we make uh, inferences about relationships that aren't there. And sometimes that bias trips us up time and time again. <laughs> 
So I want to take a little detour for the moment and uh, talk, tell you, give you, show you a clip from uh, the television show that I did uh, that Nick mentioned. So I hosted this show on the Oprah Winfrey Network, and my job was to be the scientific foil to a believing co-host. So if you've watched The X-Files, it was like a Mulder and Scully setup. And uh, my uh, Mulder happened to be a, a man named Randall Sullivan, who's a, who's a journalist who believes in miracles. And my job was to use deductive reasoning and critical thinking to try to assess whether there was a natural explanation for some of these uh, um, phenomenon that people were describing. So come on and have a seat. So one of my favorite uh, parts of the show was when we talked to someone who claimed that she could defy the laws of nature with her own intuition, that she could use her intuitive sense uh, in order to see things and, and that, that most of us can't see with our naked eye uh, and predict things that would happen in the future. This is a woman named Pan Coronado. She's an intuitive, a psychic, and uh, she works with um, you know, certain police officers to help find missing children, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that we ha had to do is try to evaluate how, you know, whether she did have this intuitive sense that, you know, could, could um, go beyond what is, is the laws of physics. So let me have her tell you in her own words uh, what she's going to be doing. Remote viewing is a term that was coined uh, by the military. And it's a process of obtaining intuitive information about a target, which is either that's me, a person, <laughs> location, an event, that's Randall, an object, anything they want to know about, without the, your five senses. Can you show us how this how remote viewing might work? I'm a little Can skeptical. To, to uh, give you a little demonstration. Okay. We brought um, some photographs in one in each of these five manila envelopes. So what I suggest is you two randomly choose one of the photographs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assign a, what I call a coordinate to it. The number's random. The number means nothing. It's just for me to connect with this particular target. You can have that back. Just make sure that I don't see it. I actually like to stay blind. You don't mind. Okay. So I'm kind of going through the center process of getting quiet, getting centered, getting focused. It's time to work now. I'm concentrating on the coordinate. <clears throat> okay, so the first image that came in for me was green. There's blue. And light blue. There's something angular meaning I see some sort of sharp line. Green feels natural, pointed. Reminds me of um, high needles. I'm also getting another concept of green that's man-made. Uh, plastic. Feels like plastic to me. I keep getting a flash of light blue. I, uh, <clears throat> my brain wants to turn it into sky. I'm not sure of sky my brain's wanting you to turn it into a sky. So I'm going to start listening and hear the crunching of leaves under my feet. So I'm going to listen to see what else I can hear at the site. I hear the sound of children playing. Definitely get an overall impression of youth. Whether they come here and enjoy this place on occasion or something of that nature. For the first time I get a sense of looking over something, over the edge of something. And I think for me that's around. Very impressive. Oh. <laughs> oh, that is okay. There were so many hits that, you know, I couldn't help but be quite impressed. I, I was persuaded there's something to it and that she has abilities. Does that match what you were saying? No. <laughs> um, so you can imagine why I stopped it there. Uh, so one of the reasons that I stayed blind was because I knew how hard it is not to see the hits when you're actually looking at that picture. 
So this is an example of how our brains are, are primed to see patterns. We want to associate things. We want to, we want to find that relationship that may, may be there, uh, no matter how far-fetched it is. And it's very hard to remain skeptical and rational and think about, you know, it, you know kind of ignore the hits and think about all the misses that she missed. Um, and that's one of the reasons I was writing things down, is that I wanted to try to get a list of all the things she said and then go and see whether, was, whether there were just as many things that she missed as that she hit. Or even more importantly, whether there are certain characteristics of photographs that um, are there, like blue skies, for example. How many photographs have blue skies in them or green things that are related to nature? So um, in the interest of sort of helping you see uh, how, how our brains are really geared towards patterns and how you know, it doesn't matter what image she would have had you know, put in front of her, we would have found a certain number of hits. I randomly picked a number, uh, three images from my own iPhoto library, uh, and I'd like to listen again to what she, you know, just the clip in which she actually describes the image, and show you that you know there's hits in all of these images, um, and that's one of the reasons that people can be quite, uh, you know, astonished and 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 um, and believe in that someone like her has an intuitive capability. So let's just do this as an exercise. <clears throat> okay, so the first image that came in for me was green. There's blue. And light blue. There's something angular, meaning I see some sort of sharp line. Green feels natural, pointed. Reminds me of um, high needles. I'm also getting another concept of green that's man-made. Uh, plastic. Feels like plastic to me. I keep getting a flash of light blue. I, uh, <clears throat> my brain wants to turn it into sky. I'm not sure it's sky, but my brain's wanting me to turn it into a sky. So I'm going to start listening and hear the crunching of leaves under my feet. So I'm going to listen to see what else I can hear at the site. I hear the sound of children playing. I definitely get an overall impression of these. Whether they come here and enjoy this place on occasion or something of that nature. For the first time, I get a sense of looking over something, over the edge of something. And I think for me, that's around. So it's hard to now. S oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to actually stop that particular audio clip, so we'll just move on. But uh, it's hard to to not see some kind of hits in those images. Um, but it's also hard to get over the fact that the first one seemed so compelling that surely there were more hits in that one. Um, but I assure you that if you went and listed all of the hits and the misses, that you'd pretty much find the same pattern in every single one of the photographs. But it's so com we are so much more interested in these associations. In fact, there are far more opioid receptors in your association, association areas in your brain than in any of your primary sensory areas. It's pleasurable to find these kinds of associations. And that's essentially one of the ways in which our minds make sense of the world. So as I mentioned before, this, we've, we are prone towards false positives. And in the visual world, we see um, animated things where there are ambiguous, inanimate objects. But when we have uh, events that are occurring in time, uh, we tend to tell, we tend to uh, put them into a story. So here is essentially um, another kind of event-related equivalent of pareidolia. So I just want you to watch this little clip uh, and think about what it is that you're seeing. Uh, if you had to describe to me what you saw after I play this video, how would you describe it? So how many of you thought that the black square was a bit of a bully? 
You know, that's a pretty common uh, interpretation of this little video. If it's just a black square running around the screen, and yet in this very simple one minute video, we've constructed a story. It has characters, uh, it has a setting, it has a, almost even a three act structure, something beginning, something beginning to happen and then a, a climax as the, as the square is trying to get into the house. Um, and then a resolution, you know, they lock up the square, but you know, it ends on a cliffhanger like every good horror flick. So, <laughs> so this is just an example of how something as simple as three shapes running around a screen, probably the simplest animation you can imagine, we still are, feel compelled to tell, or, uh, to concoct a story out of it. And sometimes we concoct these stories even about the, the very things that happen within our own minds. So throughout the day you're making all kinds of decisions. Sometimes you just have to make a decision without thinking it through rationally <coughs> and evaluating all the different outcomes. And a lot of this, this decision making is based on intuitive or implicit processes. Things are not available to your consciousness. You don't really know why you make these decisions. And some of the really interesting early studies in, in the social sciences investigated just how you do make sense of these decisions that you make and the stories that you tell yourself and you tell the experimenter about why you made one decision or another. So let me start by describing a, a, one of the quintessential experiments by uh, My, uh, Norman Mayer in 1931. So uh, he had his subjects come into a room and there were two ropes that were tied and this was supposed to be an insight problem. And he was really interested in seeing how many different ways people could come up with to solve this particular problem. So he left a series of tools also in the room um, and you know, tied the ropes just so that you can't you know, hold one and then the other and then tie them together. And he told his subjects that the goal of the task is to tie the two ropes together. And you know, certainly people, there are a couple of easy solutions, like for example, there was an extension cord, and so people would take one end of the extension cord, tie it to one end of the rope, and then you know, tie the other end to the other rope, and then, you know, then they'd have the, the two ropes tied together. Um, but he also noticed that there are a couple of more difficult solutions. And although he was really interested in um, sort of this insight, uh, how do people get this insight, um, he wanted to sort of turn people towards these solutions in a way that you know, they wouldn't kind of notice that he did. So about you know, halfway through each trial, each experiment, um, he'd kind of casually walk over and you know, set one of the ropes swinging. And that would get the idea in the subject's head that if you could, you could use one of the ropes as a pendulum, right? You could tie a, you know, a set of pliers or some kind of an instrument onto one end of the rope, use it as a pendulum, and then tie the ropes together that way. And that was one of the more innovative solutions to this problem. So what uh, Mayer noticed that, what, that really made, hit, made this study particularly famous is that when he asked people, after he had you know, subtly, casually done this you know, hint, um, why, how they came up with that solution, Almost nobody mentioned the fact that he had set the rope swinging. Uh, nobody realized that, I think only three subjects out of you know, the, the, the vast number of subjects that he studied, realized that you know, that particular action actually triggered the solution for them. And even more interestingly, when he asked, you know, well, what, you know, what made you think of this, they'd come up with some pretty innovative and creative stories. So for example, one person actually said, well, having exhausted everything else, the next thing was to swing it. Um, I thought of the situation of swinging across a river. I had imagery of monkeys swinging from trees. This imagery appeared simultaneously with the solution. The idea appeared complete. Now, if any of you have taken a psychology course or are psychology graduate students, um, you might recognize that this is what a psychology professor <laughs> actually came up with. So the psychology professors are no less immune to making up these stories, which I think is probably one of the best parts of the study, is that the, the, the sort of most elaborate confabulator came from uh, a professor of psychology, a colleague of, of Mayer's. Um, so, but the point is, is that we do confabulate. So we create stories and we, we in order to understand our own behavior. Um, and my mentor at the University of Toronto where I did my undergrad calls this honest lying. So there's no intent to, de to deceive. The person isn't trying to deceive. Um, they don't know why they came up with this solution. And so instead, their minds create an interpretation that helps them to make sense of the world. We see this kind of confabulation in patients who have particular damage to um, their frontal lobes and their uh, memory systems in, in the, um, in, uh, 
especially uh, patients who have what's called Korsakoff's amnesia, which is related to long-term alcohol abuse and a vitamin B uh, thiamine deficiency. Um, so they have a, a, a damage to their uh, thalamus and their mammillary bodies, for those of you who want to get technical. Um, but essentially the problem is, is that their minds still create these uh, solutions, but their fact-checking has gone awry. Um, they no longer can tell uh, what, what is, is factual and what is simply invented by their brains. Uh, the same uh, confabulation is uh, sometimes seen in patients who are called split-brain patients, were studied um, by Michael Gazaniga and uh, Roger Sperry, uh, whose, whose uh, two hemis cerebral hemispheres have been cut in half in order to prevent the spread of epilepsy, and so now you can query one hemisphere from the other. Uh, and it turns out that when one hemisphere doesn't know what the other hemisphere is doing and is asked why it, he made a particular choice, uh, he'll make up a reason. But this is, this is patient work, right? So you think, okay, well, but, you know, patients, we can see that the system has gone awry, but most of us aren't privy to this kind of confabulation. Well, a few more recent studies have shown that actually we are just as, in some ways, uh, guilty of confabulation. So in, uh, uh, Nisbet and Wilson wrote a wonderful review paper in Psych Review in 1977 in which they described a series of experiments in which they showed this everyday confabulation. So this was one of them. They showed, um, they went to a department store and they showed 378 subjects uh, these different nightgowns in, in, in their, their study, this, the nightgowns were different. Or they showed 52 subjects uh, four identical pairs of nylon stockings. And they asked the subjects to choose the one that they preferred. And um, they went to the nylon stockings having seen what happened with the nightgowns because it just seemed that no matter what order they put the nightgowns in, uh, people seemed to prefer the ones on the right. There was a bias towards choosing uh, the items on the right-hand side of the, of the table or the rack or wherever it was. So even when the nylon stockings were completely identical, people tended to choose the ones on the right. And when asked, why did you choose the one on the right, not one single person spontaneously mentioned the position. Um, when asked, virtually all subjects denied it, usually with a glance at the interviewer suggesting that they felt either that they had misunderstood the question or were dealing with a madman. That is a direct quote from the Psych Review paper. So we do this all the time. When we, have, when we make a choice and we're asked about it, we don't actually know why it is that we chose something. We make up a story. Even more recently, uh, Johansson and colleagues just published a science paper in 2005 where uh, they used sleight of hand in order to manipulate a person's choice. So they had their subjects um, at, you know, asked which of these two uh, faces do you find more attractive, these women, and uh, the subject would pick one of them. And on the target trials, the experimenter would use sleight of hand to actually switch up uh, which one uh, the subject uh, at, chose and then asked the subject, why did you choose this particular woman? And people came up with all kinds of wonderful uh, uh, um, confabulations. So only 26% of manipulated trials were actually caught by the subjects. So 75% of the time, people didn't even notice that their choice had been switched. Um, and when asked to you know, state the reason behind their choice, uh, they confabulated their outcome uh, to justify, um, w you know, to, to justify the, the choice in front of them as opposed to the one that they had actually chosen. So here's just a, a series of, of, um, of confabulations that they made. So she's radiant. I would rather have approached her at a bar than the other one. I like earrings. The other one wasn't wearing earrings. That was the original choice. Um, you know, I thought she had way more personality. <laughs> she was the most appealing. Eh, I don't know. It's probably the only one that's really factually true. Um, <laughs> but so, so, so the point of this is that, is that we do make what's called this introspective illusion. We think that we are more privy to the, to the workings of our mind than we actually are. We think we understand why we do the things that we do, um, when in fact we don't. And uh, sometimes, uh, this, it's, it's in particular these implicit uh, uh, processes that are most prone to confabulation. But just uh, before we leave confabulation, move on to stories that are a little bit more uh, based in, in reality, or at least under, understandably uh, and intentionally fictional, I want to show you my favorite uh, video of confabulation in action. So this is actually from an infomercial um, and about this, the printing capabilities of this particular uh, camera printer <coughs> setup and uh, just uh, watch closely as this man is a, a genius confabulator. I'll do it. I'll put it print. I won't put it out. 
Now, while we're doing that, let me show you something really impressive. That picture, remember the picture of the horse I showed you earlier? Well, here it is, Juana. That's a big horse. It's a big horse. You get the camera, you get the printer. 4X optical zoom. Schneider lens. Photo printer. SD card. Look at that horse. <laughs> the bushy tail, the big teeth, the hooves. Okay, my producer, Tara Kitts, just told me this is the horse that's a butterfly. <laughs> Actually, it may in fact be a mom. <laughs> yeah, so he's just making it up. Um, but yeah, so we, we do this all the time. So why is it that, you know, what, what is it about this kind of confabulation? Like, why is it in, in, inbred in part of us? Well, you know, it's become almost a cliche that uh, stories are important. So in virtually every industry that involves any kind of social interaction or persuasion between people, the story reigns supreme. Um, in Hollywood, every script is analyzed to how good the story is. Uh, it's a corporate buzzword, and it's used in domains as diverse as fashion, you know, banking, even science these days. And in reality TV, where you'd think, well, the story is nothing, there's no story, things just unfold as it is in reality. Um, in fact, the story producer is one of the most important people on the set and um, you know, eventually behind, uh, in, in the, in behind the scenes. So um, this is one of the things that I experienced uh, firsthand in, in Miracle Detectives, where we, we started every episode knowing what the story was going to be. Um, and, and that was really interesting to me to watch this unfold, even though I had. Um, I was able to, you know, bring in experts and do my own detective work. It had to there had to be a story arc. Um, and so what is this story arc? Well, in Hollywood, we talk about the three-act structure, which permeates virtually every theatrical piece, every story um, out there can almost be analyzed using this three-act structure. So at first, there's an introduction, there's a setup, the characters are introduced, the setting is introduced. Then some, something happens, there's a rising action, there's a, there's a conflict. Um, eventually, there's a crisis, and then there's some kind of a resolution. And one of the reasons that stories are, keep our attention are so compelling is that we kind of intuitively now know and understand this structure. And so when we know this structure, um, we become engaged in what's happening to the characters. There's a joy in being able to predict, predict the anticipated outcome. And um, in fact, uh, when things follow causally one from another, then we really get this sense that the story is good and our attention has to be kept. But there's a fine line between being able to predict the outcome and be, it being so predictable that it's not interesting. So we like surprises once in a while, as long as the surprises kind of make sense within the context of the story. The same is true in music. Um, the type of music that you prefer to listen to changes as you become more and more immersed in a type of music because you learn the structure of it. And once you've learned the structure of it, then you can anticipate the outcome. And that's why it becomes so exciting when you, be, you know, get really into a type of music like jazz, where then you can go and watch somebody improvise and you know they're riffing about the same kind of melody because you can hear the melody in your head. If you can't hear that melody in your head, you're kind of lost and it's not that interesting to you and you're not as compelled by it. The same is true in the story. So one of the most important and compelling parts about story is creating suspense, right? Creating the sense that something is about to happen. Um, and, and we can't help but try to anticipate or cringe or look forward to what it is that's about to happen. So Alfred Hitchcock actually said that the very definition of suspense is to give the audience information that the characters on screen don't have. So if there's a bomb on stage that everybody sees, that's not as interesting. But if you watch somebody place a bomb, and now you watch the characters go on about the business, all of a sudden there's suspense. You have information that the characters don't, and you know what might happen. So all of a sudden you're engaged in the story. The same thing is happening in so many other parts of our, of our lives when we, when we think about how we use story. We want to be able to understand what it is that's going to happen next, whether it's the person in front of us or ourselves. And so when we, we can't help but think of all the, those different scenarios, and we remain engaged uh, when we have this idea that we can anticipate what's happening next. But you might argue that, hang on a minute, if I know what's going to happen next, I'm no longer interested in the story, right? This is what we call spoilers. Um, so 
you know, we, we hate the fact if someone tells us what's going to happen, say, on a show like Downton Abbey. You know, I don't know if, you, if, you, if you're late watching the last episode of Downton Abbey. I'm sure you didn't check Twitter because you don't want to know, you know, what happened at the very end because that'll spoil the story for you. Um, Nobel Prize winning uh, neuroeconomist uh, Donald Kahneman talks about the experiencing self and the remembering self and such a way that there are these two ways of, of regarding uh, what's happened to you. So it's the experiencing self in the moment where you're experiencing and then there's your, the re remembering self which remembered how much you enjoyed something. So he gives this wonderful example of when you're in a concert hall and you're listening to this beautiful piece of music and you're extremely moved and it's engaging and then just before the final you know, chord somebody coughs. And you think, oh, they've completely ruined the experience for me. It's not true. You've experienced it the same. They've only you know, ruined the memory of the experience for you. So we think that's the same thing uh, to do with, with stories, although it seems counterintuitive that if we know the end of a story, we certainly won't find that story so compelling. Well, it turns out the devil really is in the details. So a recent psychological science paper in 2011 came out showing that actually story spoilers don't spoil stories. We find stories no less pleasurable if we know the ending. And you think, well, okay, that might be true for a story that's as complex like some kind of fantasy uh, fictional novel or you know, something like Pride and Prejudice, but it's certainly not true of mysteries or ironic twist stories. Um, and you'd be wrong. It looks, when you look at the pleasure rating, the mean hedonic rating that people give to various stories, if they're spoiled, if the, if these, uh, the data are in dark gray, and if they're unspoiled, they're in white, it doesn't matter what kinds of stories uh, the person is, is enjoying. They still find them just as pleasurable if, the, if they've been spoiled, if they know the ending, than if they don't. And you might argue that across all of these stories, the only trend is that they might even find them more pleasurable if they already know the ending. But, if, but certainly they don't find them any less pleasurable. So we need to be able to, what, what we enjoy is being able to recreate these, these vivid experiences and imagine and, and sort of get led along the story. But why is it that these, these spoilers don't spoil the actual enjoyment of, of the story? Well, as any of you who know, who have studied um, memory, is that we forget the vast majority of details within the first 24 hours after we encounter them. So one of the famous uh, first studies showing this was by Ebbinghaus, where he wanted to just you know, learn a, a whole series of nonsense uh, syllables. And he found that you know, it, within the first 24 hours, he showed the vast majority of forgetting. And then it kind of tapers off. And we can, we can sort of speculate now about what happens at the 24-hour period. Um, there's some evidence now that during sleep, a lot of those important things that we've learned during the day are consolidated and, and put into long-term memory. So we don't forget nearly as much after our first sleep cycle. Um, but the important point here is that we forget the vast majority of details very, very quickly. And what we remember are the gist, uh, the gist of, of, of a story or the fundamental um, um, sort of uh, uh, theme or, or aspect of it. And in fact, even when we retell a story, a story that we love or a story that we found um, interesting, we change the way that story is told. So one of the in initial studies was by a man named Bartlett who used this, this uh, story called War of the Ghosts and he found that with each retelling, the story changed drastically. But the same is even true of our visual memory. So here's a, an example of an original drawing which started out as an owl um, and over many repetitions from memory turned into a cat. So we do the same thing where, you know, in this case, you don't even really remember the gist, you could argue. I mean, you remember sort of maybe a little bit of a shape and that it was an animal of some sort. Um, but over time, uh, all of those detail, details are lost. So our memories are, in this way, um, are, 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 are very fallible. And we know that in order to, when, every time we, we remember something, we need to recreate this vivid experience. And that's actually what we find compelling. So for my PhD, I actually studied a type of memory uh, that uh, is really tied to our own autobiography, and it's called episodic memory, which is our memory for the events that have happened in our lives. And um, I like to say that you know, memory, remembering itself, is really a constructive process. It's something that we redo every time we have to remember. It's not that we just go into um, our memory bank and pick out the data and there it is. No, we have to recreate the experience in order to remember those details again. <laughs> and in fact, um, that, that 
recreation then, of course, is, is riddled with, with errors and, and things that are omitted and things that are changed and things that are morphed by our current mood and our current political beliefs even um, and the things that are important to us. Um, but it's a very pleasurable thing to do to go in what we call this mental time travel, which is to actually feel like you're going back into the past and you're recreating that in, in that um, experience. And you know, one might argue that one of the only times in which we actually, the time's arrow does move backwards is, in, um, is during mental time travel. And that phrase was coined by the, the godfather of episodic, of episodic memory, Endel Tolving, who's um, also in Canada, which I'm from too, so that's important. It's not important. Uh, in any case, <laughs> what are the brain regions that are involved then in this process of recollecting? Well, we have these frontal cortex regions, so the ones that say PFC, prefrontal cortex, which is the front of your brain, um, which is the part of your brain that in some ways is the, the um, last to develop and the, the last to have evolved. It's where we do all of our decision making and, um, and it's where, you know, sort of what we call the executive functions of the brain happen. So, um, and so you see in, in these various parts of the prefrontal cortex, um, monitoring verification of the retrieved information, higher level mnemonic control operations, so trying to figure out you know, whether what you're remembering is actually what you want to remember, um, cue specification, strategic search, etc. And then there's the medial temporal lobe, which is my favorite region of the brain where I spent um, all of my time essentially as a graduate student. And the medial temporal lobe is you know, behind your, your, sort of on the inside of your ears in this part of the brain. And um, in here, this is where you actually get the cues and compare them with what you've stored in memory to figure out and to recreate this memory. So just shifting a little bit more deeply into this medial temporal lobe, um, which I'm so fond of, there's this hippocampus, which is the structure right in the middle of the temporal lobe. Um, it sort of is like a fist and then the rest of the neocortex comes around it. Um, it's not actually uh, rainbow colored, um, <laughs> but uh, that looks a lot prettier on a slide. And it, if you take a cross section of the hippocampus, if you sliced it across like that, and then looked at it, um, you'd see this beautiful architecture. And this is one of my favorite things about this hippocampus, is that it has you know, these various regions that are interconnected, and information flows in specific ways throughout these regions. And each one of them is important uh, for a different process of memory. So to unpack that a little bit, um, you get information from all of your senses that comes into this region here called the entorhinal cortex. And then the information is, uh, is sent up uh, first or in, in, uh, in one direction to the dentate gyrus. The dentate gyrus is one of the few parts of your brain where new neurons can actually grow, um, even in the adult brains, ne neurogenesis. But you can imagine that there's a lot of information going into your dentate gyrus. And if you, if you think about how, to, how neurons represent information, you might think that if a lot of neurons by changing their firing pattern represent any given item, uh, then you, you're going to come up with this problem with you know, not being able to separate one pattern of activity that you know, relies, is, is representing one item with another pattern of activity that represents another item. So the way the dentate gyrus solves this problem is by what we call sparse coding. Um, so that means that only a very, very small number of neurons in the dentate gyrus represent any given item that's out or any, any stimulus that comes in um, through the entorhinal cortex. And as such, um, all of the other neurons that aren't necessarily, um, that, that aren't activated by things that are coming in to the brain sort of lower their baseline um, neural activity and quiet down so that those few neurons that are actually representing what's important out into the world uh, can, be, can be heard and um, the, 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 uh, um, the signal can be amplified later on. So this is what we call pattern separation. So this is how when you're trying to remember something, um, you, you know, you're, you, you, a little cue here and there can be particularly salient. And then once you get that cue, um, the information then gets transferred up here into the CA3 region, which is another region of the brain, which is really interesting because it, has its, it sort of has this back propagation. It feeds back upon itself. So this sparse information that came in from dentate gyrus goes into CA3 and is amplified because all of a sudden there's this kind of you know, feedback loop that happens. So we call this pattern completion. So this is when you have a couple of cues that come in that are you know, little things. Maybe you went home for uh, the holidays and you saw you drove past your um, your, your old middle school and all of a sudden these memories come flooding back. Right? You've got this, this amplification process that happens uh, in the CA3. And then 
Um, what, then that information continues in this essentially what's, what's a one directional loop. So it comes into CA1 and then into the subiculum, um, which is really involved in, in the retrieval processes uh, of episodic memory in particular. And it goes and it talks to the rest of your brain to try to figure out how what's happening here, what it's created, how closely that resembles what actually happened or what you think happened or the things that you've already stored. So we have this process of reconstructing the memory, first off by having some kind of a cue, which is then amplified, which is then sent out to retrieve more details, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see how the very architecture of this structure uh, is, is designed to sort of create a kind of a, a narrative, a kind of, you know, find things that have been associated with each other. And because this medial temporal lobe then interacts with the frontal cortex cortices that have sort of have this structure of stories in them embedded, then we can use that, that structure to figure out what elements that we um, want to retrieve for this particular story. So the hippocampus is well connected to other brain regions. Its neural architecture enables this rapid learning. Um, and then finally, it acts as an index or a pointer to pull together associations and retrieve these vivid <coughs> memories. So I'm biased. I love the hippocampus. A lot of people talk about episodic memories as also being just as important in terms of frontal lobe functions. But what I've been really interested in is what makes a person believe their own episodic memories? How do we know that what we're remembering is based on what we actually experienced versus something that we've just confabulated or made up? Well, a recent study um, in 2003, actually, I guess it's not that recent now, 10 years ago, <laughs> um, Dan Rubin did this study of looking at people who um, were engaging in episodic remembering, and then they were asked how confident they were that their memory was accurate. And they found that the extent of reliving uh, is guided by the strength of visual, visual and auditory imagery and emotions. So if they felt like they could um, recreate the visual and auditory things that happened to them, they, they se seem to feel that they really are reliving the memory as opposed to just you know, retrieving details. And their belief in the accuracy was predicted by knowledge of the location in which the event took place. So this is going to be important in the next couple of minutes. The location, if you can remember where the event happened, you were much more likely to think that you were accurate in terms of your remembering. Now, I'm not saying you were accurate, that you think that you were accurate in terms of what you were remembering. And finally, having the memory form a coherent story predicted both recollection, so the amount of, of, of you know, reliving that you're experiencing, and your belief in the accuracy. So the story really is the thing that if you could form a good story out of that memory, boy, did you think that memory was true. So what, what about this um, location thing? Why would location be so critical or, or such a driving force in terms of um, episodic memory belief? Well, it turns out that there's one other thing that the hippocampus is really good at, and that's spatial navigation. And one of my favorite um, pieces of evidence for how the hippocampus is involved in spatial navigation comes from London cab, cab drivers. So in London, in order to become a cab driver, you have to pass what is called the knowledge, um, which means you have to learn from memory this map of London. You have to know all of the streets within six miles of Charing Cross, and you have to know at least 20,000 landmarks. So it takes people years to acquire the knowledge. Um, and you would argue that well, anybody who can do this must already have a large hippocampus. And it, true enough, uh, people who are London cab drivers do actually have a physically larger hippocampus than people who are not uh, London cab drivers. But even more interestingly, um, their hippocampus grows with training. So in this study by Willett and McGuire, they actually looked at the amount of, of hippocampus, both before and after training, in people who wanted to uh, pass the knowledge and who successfully passed it. And they found that particularly in the posterior part of the hippocampus, so there's the hippocampus, there's the back of it, um, they found these differences in gray matter volume. So the hippocampi were actually larger after training. And this is only the case if they actually passed the training. So the controls showed no differences in terms of their gray matter volume in the hippocampus. People that tried but failed showed no difference. People who tried and passed showed a significant increase in the posterior hippocampus after passing the knowledge. So because this, this, the hippocampus is involved in, is, is, is 
very much tied to reliving and retrieving episodic memories and spatial navigation might be one of the reasons why spatial nav the, the location of um, memories in, in, in which we when we've experienced them gives us this sense that wow yeah I'm definitely sure that this memory is true but there's one more thing that the hippocampus is involved in that I think is relevant to what we're talking about today and that is when you look at the parts of the brain that are involved in remembering the past in this vivid, re-experiential way and in imagining the future. So coming back to what we talked about, the point of stories is try to anticipate the outcome, try to figure out what's going to happen. Well, it turns out that those same brain regions are involved. The medial temporal lobe and the frontal regions are both involved in remembering past events and imagining future events. In fact, when you see people who have hippocampal damage, they can not only no longer remember their past or, or lay down new long-term memories, but they also can't imagine what they could possibly want to do next. So the question I still haven't answered is why our brains have evolved this way, in such a way that we are sort of so tied to, to storytelling and imagining um, and figuring out what's going to happen next. And um, the truth is we don't really know. But you know, here's the part of the talk where I actually get to tell you a, a reasonably good story. And that is that perhaps understanding the context in which our brains evolved might help us at least speculate as to why stories have become so important to us. So it turns out that our brain size or, you know, has really increased um, significantly when we started living in social groups. Uh, this seems to be one of the times in which we really showed this huge leap in evolution. But you might argue brain size itself doesn't really matter. We could have just gotten bigger, right? An elephant is a bigger brain than I do. Um, but that doesn't mean that an elephant is a better storyteller. OK, uh, that's true. But it turns out that when I look at the ratio of neocortex to brain size, that's something that humans are particularly good at. And then I look at the group size in which that particular species is living. We find that humans actually do increase. We see, we see this increase in neocortex ratio as they live in bigger and bigger groups. So this means that there's something about living in a group that seems to be either coming from or causing uh, this increase in neocortex. And um, I would argue uh, that one of the things that is important when you're living in a group is to make sure that you're, bo you're, you're bound together and that you understand the intentions of others. You develop a theory of mind uh, in others and you, you know what they're going to do next so that you can live in, in that type of environment. And, um, this is called the social brain hypothesis, I should, I should um, mention, by Robin Dunbar in 1998. This idea that as group size uh, uh, increases, our neocortex ratio increases in response to living in these groups. Um, and then there's some people that go even further and speculate that the point of stories is to develop empathy and to bind, uh, uh, you know, put you into a social group and, and bind you together. I'm not sure that that's true, but it certainly makes a good story. So. My final point is just to say that our addiction to stories trains us to try to predict the future and maybe even live to see another day. Thanks. So we have a few minutes. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Come and talk. Yeah, I was curious if that congratulation, like for instance with the two ladies, um, do you guys know, does that happen? when they're telling it, or does it already happen as soon as they saw the different picture? Ah, um, it's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I think it, it happens as they are trying to make sense of their own decision. So I think, I think it's not that you know, they see the choice that the person has said. You know, it's not really until the, the experimenter asks the question, why did you pick this one, that they make it up. And you, know, you could argue that, you know, we, that, that it, it, that, that you know, we don't know exactly when their brain is making up that story because, of course, it's coming out of them. Um, but, I, but I think it's going to be very close to them trying to reason out why they took, made this particular choice. And that's what leads them to confabulate. What's interesting to me is that they don't know that they're making it up, um, that it really, you know, it really sounds like they're trying to make sense of their own behavior. And, and you know, I, I picked a couple of really um, colorful confabulatory statements, but most of the statements are more kind of you know, neutral than that. Well, you know, they'll, they'll come up with a reason. Doesn't sound like a great reason, but that's the best they could come up with. Yeah. Um, so you talked about how the st story spoilers don't spoil stories. Like, what would be the difference between us not liking predictable stories or rewatching a story versus hearing a spoiler? Is it like because? 
Well, there are certainly some stories that are better than other stories. And these are the stories that are more complex, usually, that, that sort of follow their, and you know, it, that some of that is partly taste related, um, although sort of university we enjoy what's called the hero's journey which is you know a particular character that you can relate to um, so whether it's a, a, a you know a, a female or a male character depending on your gender you know more women kind of relate to uh, female characters and vice versa um, and then you can follow that character as he or she goes through a series of obstacles you know that kind of story can be is more compelling than one that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense where things don't things just seem to happen that don't you can't really relate causally um, and all of this makes sense within the, the framework of a story, right? If, if, if the point of stories in terms of your mind is to try to be able to understand what's going to happen next, when you just have ser things that happen that seem totally random and don't make any sense, that's not as interesting. It's like listening to music that you don't know the structure of. You kind of can't make sense of it. Um, but as long as it follows this kind of framework, there's a sweet spot of you, know, you being able to understand the structure, but the structure being complicated enough where it's not so overly predictable that you know, everything that the person does that you, know, you would have predicted. We enjoy often um, anticipating multiple outcomes and you know, hoping for one or another, but any of those outcomes being possible. So if there's really only one outcome that's possible, that's less interesting. But when you know, we see a, a series of outcomes and then you know, we can, one of them happens, and, and, and that way we, we find those stories pleasurable. Um, and also, there, you know, within as long as it stays within the structure of the world in the story. So, you know, even if it's let's say it's some kind of science fiction story where it, the author has set up certain laws of physics that don't apply to our current universe, as long as whatever happens later on is is um, consistent within that new framework that that author has set up for you, uh, we still find it compelling. But we also like surprises. So surprises are pleasurable as long as they fit within, they make sense within the world of the story. I was going to ask you a quick question about that. Um, do you think that's because we like reaffirming what we already know? And, and we kind of like can reach, like, although we know the main conclusion, we, I didn't know that's the way that they, that, that conclusion was. I actually think it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think that we, we are still infovores. Like, we like information. We like making associations. If you're bored, it's really hard not to check your phone. Um, you know, it's really hard. There's one of the things that I think is probably the worst thing in the world is to be sitting in a waiting room with no reading material. That's like, I, you know, it's a fate worse than death in some ways. Uh, it's unbelievably, you know, we don't like that situation at all. Um, so I think that, you know, we don't want to always just be right. I think that. Um, we don't mind getting new information as long as we can associate it with what we already know. Um, so with, as long as it you know, makes some kind of sense, you know, we are interested. That's one of the things I also noticed on doing my television show is that a lot of people you know, who believed in these miraculous events would come up with their, uh, an explanation. It's not like they would say, oh, you know, it's a miracle, I don't get it. They would say, this happened because this happened, and then that happened, and then this happened. Like they would have a story out of it, and you know, it just turned out that the elements of their story world, um, the assumptions that they made were different from the assumptions that I make, or that you know, we can agree in, in a room full of scientists are part of the natural laws, right? So that's kind of that's sort of one of the differences in terms of, but but there's still this, the story was just as compelling. Yeah. I have to study language all the time. It, it would be would using words and sentences that are in the form of a story within a sentence help me memorize words? I mean, has there been any kind of research on that? Well, certainly, cert I mean, if you're talking about memory, right, certainly creating um, an, an association or structure that you can then go back and pick up all the elements from is, is one of the best ways of remembering, right? So one of the classic examples of, you know, if you have to remember a list of words, use um, what's called like the method of loci, where you put them in the different parts of the room, and as you need to remember them, you go in your mind's eye to those different parts of the room and pick up all of those elements. Um, or you know, you use some kind of a mnemonic that you that one thing leads to another. I think that's the critical component: is that um, you don't want to have to remember. You know, you're limited with how much you can hold in mind at any given time. You don't want to have to remember. You know. 40 things that are unrelated. But if you can remember one, which leads you then to two, which leads you then to three, which leads you down to four, um, then you can get to 40 by the end of, of, of the thing, which actually is probably how people remember pi. Um, I actually think they go from, you know, if you ask them what is the 7,000th digit, they probably wouldn't be able to say eight. That, that's not it. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but, you know, um, but they can go from one, and then that takes them to the other, and then the third, and then and so on. And so that's how, and, and that totally fits with this idea of it's, it's, they're really making a story out of it, right? They're going from one thing to another. 
Another quick question about sleeping. So has there been any studies showing that if I take naps, my brain will consolidate all my information? So I take a language class, I want to memorize these same words, hold lots of stories, put them in a certain order. Can I take a nap? Lots of studies have shown that. Lots of studies have shown that, that, and depending on what kind of sleep, right? So first of all, you have to be a good napper, and you have to be able to get into the stages of sleep that are going to um, be beneficial for the type of learning that you want to do. And, it, and the type of, the stage of the sleep differs depending on the type of material that you want to learn. If you want to learn a procedural skill like learning a bike, um, there's you know, one particular stage of sleep that you need to get into, which is really, it turns out, REM sleep. But if you want to learn a list of words, it's really stage four or slow wave or deep, deep sleep. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, the, the different parts of the brain that are involved in, in consolidating this information are active in different ways during those, memor those sleep stages. And because we sleep in stages, um, you know, you, you have to allow your mind to get into that stage. So you have to really titrate how long you're going to nap um, to make sure that you, you have enough time to get into that stage. Uh, and then, you know, when you're in that stage, your, your brain really is replaying what's important. Um, so one of the things that I tend to do when I need to, like for example, memorize music or you know remember a talk or something like that, um, I really do, insofar as it doesn't keep me up, replay it just before I go to bed, um, so that I kind of just get my mind into that framework. And uh, I do I do find that most of the time when I wake up in the morning, you know I've solved a problem or I've I'm, I'm a little bit further ahead, you know, in, in the music, than before I slept. And actually, a friend of mine who finished his uh, PhD at Stanford is just started a company called Sheepdog Science, where they actually use um, these, I think they're EEG monitors maybe even. Um, while you sleep, uh, they monitor what stage you're in. And then when you have learned something during the day, they've actually played a series of, of, um, of sequences of musical notes or beeps or whatever. So that you know, it's supposed to entrain your brain to sort of get into that, you know, to replay that particular um, experience at a particular stage of sleep. Uh, and they're showing some pretty good data. I mean, it's still really in its infancy, and it's a bit, you know, you know, woo-woo at the moment. But um, it's kind of exciting to think that that's possibly something that could be beneficial in the future. Do all stories naturally follow the three-act structure? Um, no, some stories are bad stories, <laughs> um, and some good stories don't follow the three-act structure. But I think, you know, I think, uh, I think the the nice thing about the three-act structure is that you can manipulate it to fit almost any story. Um, so. And you know that so it, that's that and that's really critical analysis is like you know people are really in the humanities are really good at you know finding the three act structure even in stories that don't really have a three act structure, because um, it's kind of arbitrary where you put the acts. It certainly don't have to be even in terms of time or the things that happened. You know a lot of movies you'll see that middle phase is like the vast majority of the movie and that th the third act is like the last five minutes. Um, and they can still be still really compelling movies. Uh, I think the reason that we use this three-act structure is because it's one of the t tried and true ways in which people can feel satisfied at the end of having reached the story. So it's a lot of people talk about, like for example, if you watch TED Talks, they almost all follow a three-act structure, um, and uh, because that's sort of you know just tar it, it it taps into the way that our, we pay attention to you know where you know, people have really learned how long someone can pay attention before you need to switch. Um, you know, s tell a story or, or, you know, kind of switch into a different um, mode, et cetera. And uh, so, you know, the really the great persuaders have sort of mastered that and, and know how to apply it. Yeah. Um, has there been an effort to, like, quantify, like, how much surprise is, like, will elicit the most pleasure and, like, how close you need to adhere to context and not be upset people? Yeah, that, and that's, it's been really hard to quantify because it's so subjective. And the subjectivity comes from the fact that a person's experience is going to dictate you know, how familiar they are with the structure and what, what kind of their preferences are. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think that there isn't, you know, there isn't really a formula for that yet. And every industry is going to have its own you know, secret sauce. Um, but I actually suspect that you know, that kind of thing is going to change with time, too. That, you know, it's, it's as our culture changes, you know, our preferences are going to shift. Um, so I think it's going to be really hard to, you know, create something or to create some kind of a formula that will always work. Um, but, like, in, like, music, for example, if you had, like, a record of every song a person had ever listened to, you could theoretically, like, have a series of notes and know which note would 
like elicit the most pleasure? I mean, you can certainly. Um, so one of the, one of the the physical sensations of pleasure while listening to music is by getting the chills. You know, it's this feeling, um, and we can measure that. You know, using sort of biomeasures of of, of bodily. Uh, changes, and it turns out that people are very consistent within the same person, within the same piece of music, within the same performer, that they get the chills. Like Western it doesn't matter as long as the, the chills. You get the chills for this piece. If I play it ten times, seventy-five percent of the time, you're going to get the chills at exactly the same moment. And there are some structures, some musical structures that seem to be common across a lot of different places in which people get the chills. So for example, um, one thing that is, is very common is where you have a solo instrument coming from a cacophony. Um, or if you have a, a sort of a change in modulation of key uh, or some kind of a, a, a crescendo that then leads to some kind of a, a sort of a diminuendo climax. So there are certain features that seem to be more likely than others to cause the chills, but they are certainly not universal. And this is because the, you know, what gives me the chills is going to be very different from what gives you the chills. And that we still haven't found um, anything that reliably elicits that. The only thing that I think is, is sort of more reliable than almost anything else is that um, a lot of the things that do elicit the chills have one thing in common, and this is by, by, by no means all of them, but I would say the most common is that you have this like, you know, this, this single instrument coming out of a cacophony. So the guitar solo, Whitney Houston with her melisma at the end of I Will Always Love You. Um, you see this in a lot of different pieces of music. And uh, there's a man named Yang Pangsep who suggested that this actually mimics the distress cry of a child. And that there's a part of us that you know, has evolved to respond to that emotionally. <laughs> That's an evolutionarily psychology just so story, you know, but it's, it's a good story. I don't know if it's true, and I don't know really how to test it. Um, but that seems to me one of the more compelling you know, reasons. Um, so with that, that structure of the story, the three act, I know that don't other cultures have other types of stories that they tell? So is it like maybe it's based on each culture, like one culture knows what's going to happen in their own stories and they're anticipating that? I don't know. You're absolutely right. Um, and I still think that a, a good, qualified cultural critic will be able to find a three-act structure in any story from any culture. <laughs> but I do, I do agree that stories differ, of course, between cultures. And I do think that the um, common line is that one thing happens, and then another thing happens, and then another thing happens. And the point of the story is to try to make sense of what that's, what's happening. right? So the point of stories essentially are to sort of help us deal with the uncertainty in life, whether that's in someone else's behavior or in you know, what the gods are, are doing to us or you know, what's going to sort of happen next in the world. So, um, th and that seems to be pretty common across cultures. The other common thing that, that seems to be uh, across cultures um, at least from the anthropologist's point of view, is that stories do tend to um, sort of mimic social behavior and, and, and sort of scenes. So there is this pretty strong idea in, in anthropology that, um, that, you know, you, that the stories really serve this function of teaching people about you know, morality and how to behave within their own culture. Um, so you have a character who's undergoing something uh, and behaves one way or another, and that's really, you know, so it seems to be common across cultures. But in terms of the structure in which that story takes, you know, how the pace of it, um, the sort of the amount of surprise, I think that's very culturally specific. Um, and yet there are still, you know, there are still things that, you know, we oftentimes, you know, especially in things like fairy tales, I mean, we'll often listen to and be compelled by fairy tales from other cultures, even the very first time that we you know, hear them. So if you hear um, in, in, uh, in Canada, for example, we have, um, we call our, the equivalent of American Indians, First Nations, and if you see, if you hear like a story from a First Nation, uh, you know, tribe about, you know, some kind of aspect of, you know, how the snows came or whatever, if you're up in the Canadian North, it's just as compelling to me, even though it's not my culture, I still find that, you know, it's an interesting story. Do you think that's why bad, badly written stories succeed? even though the, the storytelling um, is poorly written, even though it's, it still manages to tell a good story. Yeah, I think if the story is good, people overlook the writing. Yeah. If the story is not good, people are doesn't matter how good the writing is. Right. You know, it's very hard to. I mean, for me, like, yeah, 
I mean, I, I, I'm totally biased, but you know, when you have to, <laughs> when you have to read, um, you know, particular stories by certain Victorian authors where just like nothing happens, mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's just not a great story, you know. And, and uh, so that to me, I, you know, I, that's hard. Even even though the writing is is actually, you know, totally beautiful. And vice versa, the pulp fiction that's popular, yeah, is, you know, it's trash, but it's still yeah, yeah, the writing's not great. A story that we love to read. Can't put down the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're maybe it engages other parts of the brain, like you know, the, the Fifty Shades of Grey stuff. <laughs> yeah, that I, I, yeah, I, I actually could put down that book. I, I could not get through Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> uh, my limit was there, but, uh, but yeah, I love the Twilight series. I mean, that's not great writing, and yet, you know, I was addicted. I, I couldn't put it down. I really wanted to know what happened, um, and I think that the elements are there, where you know, you have this this character who seems believable, who seems like someone you could meet in the street. And you want to know what happens to him or her, and so I, I just like lose all my credibility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, this might be like on you on your website it talks about how like science and art like kind of coalesce, mm -hmm. um, and like how like both are equally important. Um, could you to me? Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Can you yeah. talk more about that? Sure. So I think of science as um, a way to extract general principles about the world. So what we really want to know using science is what's true for everybody or, you know, at least under, you know, equal conditions. How does the world, how do we behave? Um, and art really is about using the individual experience, what's happened to me, to illuminate what's universal. So we still are after the same thing. We, under, we want to understand the world that we live in and each other and the meaning of life and all these other things. Um, but they just come from very different points of view. And to me, I think both are important because you know, if you stay in the general principles realm, often you can miss some of the really interesting things, you know, those interesting insights that come from the individual experience. Um, but if you stay in the individual experience realm, sometimes you can make really big errors about what's happening out there in the world, right? Because anecdotal evidence is not evidence, right? If it happened to you, doesn't mean it's going to happen to everybody else. Um, but I think so. I think the two together really are, you know, both important and compelling. Um, and you know, for me, art really is. Um, one of the more pleasurable aspects of art is really about empathizing with that other person, about really understanding what that person is feeling. Um, but that's me personally. A lot of people, you know, look to art to, you know, get concepts or, you know, to cry or, or, or what have you. And I think that that's, art serves all of those purposes. Um, but, you know, science really is, is how we learn about the world and how we can um, progress, make, make progress over, you know, sort of large swaths of, of uh, subjects. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's not, you know, art and science, I think both of them influence each other in positive ways, so. Um, do, do you think that we maybe have an interest in, in stories because kind of on a larger scale our life is a story? And that I guess when, when we have a knowledge of where our life has brought us to this point, we kind of accept it, but then maybe people who have like gone through traumatic experiences, which don't really, they don't really understand, I guess, who they are or where they're coming from. Do you think that has something to do with like how difficult it is for them, and like, <coughs> and I guess not understanding what the future or the end of the story is going to be? I mean, I think I think that um, your your presumption that our life is a story. Um, I, I'm not sure that's true in the end. I mean, I'm not sure anything happens for a reason or that there is meaning in the end. I mean, the, you know, we, I'm just trying to live my life and the only way that I can come to terms with my own mortality and the things that have happened to me is by finding meaning in the story of my life. <laughs> and I don't know if that's just my brain's concoction and, you know, m most probably it is and that things are just random and, you know, things just unfold. Um, that seems to be the most kind of logical explanation for my experience of the world because I've seen so many random things happen that don't seem to have meaning. Um, but yet, in order for me to function in this world, I need to find meaning. And there's a part of me that hungers for it. And in fact, um, there's some people who argue that th this, ver this, you know, this um, passion with stories is the way in which we can, um, you know, by being conscious and knowing that we're going to die, that's a pretty debilitating thing. Um, by, have, by this search for meaning and, meaning and hunger for, hungering for patterns, it's actually helping us cope with this fact that you know this horrible thing is going to happen to all of us and we're all going to die, and um, <clears throat> so I think that that's you know I, and I and I see some truth in that. Like I don't think that I can, you know, it, it would be very hard for me to function and and you know be happy if I didn't think that there would be some meaning to my life and that there, the things that I do aren't you know in some ways cosmically important. 
Um, but I have no evidence for that. And so, I, so yeah, that's, that, I think that that's um, part of what allows us to be conscious and still function, <laughs> as opposed to like, you know, crawling in a hole and. So, so it kind of makes sense that some stories, you wouldn't, wouldn't even have a meaning, the author didn't even have any, just, just an event that happened and we still kind of like it because we, we rationalize it. We'll find meaning in it. Right. That's the thing. I mean, that's what, you know, the, the whole beginning of my talk where we find meaning out of, you know, we create these associations that aren't there. I mean, she cannot see in any mind's eye what's in that picture. She's making it up. She doesn't know that she's making it up, perhaps. Like, she believes that she's, you know, seeing all these things. And she's very good at, you know, choosing things that are likely. And you'll, you'll notice that a lot of the sh things she said were very abstract. Um, my mind is telling me that it's the sky, but it might not be the sky. It's the hedging the bets, right? And yet, we can't help but be like, wow, I can't believe she's able to see this picture that she can't see. And maybe we'll say, oh, well, you know, maybe behind, you know, beforehand they showed her the picture. We didn't do any of that. Like, she really honestly did not see that photograph. And uh, she totally made it up. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, but, but yet, you know, we, we, we find meaning in it. We find meaning in little, you know, the angry black square. <laughs> Come and die. Where did she go with it at the very end of your clip when you said you were imagining and she said no? No, that, that was really honest. And I was so pleased that she, she admitted that. Because, and not because I wanted to prove her wrong or anything, but, but because then it made me feel like she wasn't just putting it on. That this, she really believes every moment of what she's doing. And she's not trying to, she's, she's confabulating maybe, but she's not, she's not, you know, it's honest. It's not, she's not trying to deceive, I don't think. I mean, maybe there's a part of I me. Mean, she does make a lot of money in what terms of, you know, from what she does. But um, in this case, I thought that was really honest. And, and, you know, she just, she doesn't understand how it works. She just is, it's intuitive. And I think that that's exactly right. She doesn't understand how it works because if she stopped to think about how it actually works, or you know, it's 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 pro it's really quite a, quite complicated that she's figured out you know how to do this over multiple training sessions. So the way people do this remote viewing is they do train for it, right? So you know <clears throat> they're they're trained to sort of tap into their intuitive sense over time. So what I think she's doing intuitively without realizing it is reading Randall's face, which is reads like a book. Mm -hmm. You know, she says something and his eyebrows go like this and then she keeps going and she gets a little more of that. And I don't even think she's doing it necessarily intentionally, but she's, you know, that's why in all of these remote viewing things, she puts that number down. She has this process, right, that she goes through. And I think that, you know, all of these things sort of put her into that framework so she can read the body language and sort of you know, think of the things that, you know, we'd be able to find these, these associations, these hits on. If she actually is positively affecting crime investigations, do you think it's because she's somehow like reading something in the officer that he hasn't even noticed yet or something? Yeah, I think that's a, t a totally possible um, thing. Uh, there's no evidence that she's actually successful. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and in some ways I think, you know, people, there, there are people out there that have become quite negatively down on these so-called psychic detectives because you know the they it's it's horrible if you're a police officer and you're trying to find a missing child like that's a horrible situation to be in like you want to f to find this out and so sometimes they they do grasp at you know straws and so like if all of a sudden they're chasing down a rabbit hole with someone and, and diverting energy from you know some other deductive work you could argue that that that's not in the interest of the missing child um, on the other hand maybe they do tap into something that you know the detectives aren't um, don't know about and, and you know are reading either the detectives or some kind of clues um, but my argument is that that's worth studying and that we should try to investigate that because if we can learn something from that we can improve detective work across the entire country um, and yet but but you know there's this this um, within the intuitive world, there's this really like they put up a lot of walls. Like we don't we don't want to be tested because you're going to kill the intuitive special sauce if you you know if we delve too deep that that's that those two things are at odds. Um, so I think that that's kind of you know where we we come at um, at a gridlock. And there are some people who are who are actually willing to study in, and a lot of money has been put you know in in the um, 70s there was this whole research institute of like you know people put in like during the Cold War, like, government put in like, millions of dollars into this kind of research, and it, it turned out that there was no evidence, nothing came out of that, that, that showed that, you know, that this actually exists. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't something that she's doing that we can, can't learn from and that we can use, and, you know, hey, if it, find, if it found the missing children nine times out of ten, I would say, yeah. But um, that doesn't, doesn't seem to be the case. But.
Um, do, you, uh, do you think that when we recall memories that we try and make them more like a story and that maybe that's why they change a little bit? I know that we try to make them more of the story. And the way that, um, because when you, when you have people tell you what they're remembering, they absolutely make it a story. And they craft their story depending on who's listening and how they feel. So if you're in a bad mood, you tend to remember the negative details of an event. If you're trying to talk to someone like uh, you know, a, a woman in a white lab coat who's your investigator writing everything down, um, your experimenter, I should say, you're going to remember totally different details than if you're telling your best friend. Um, so, and, and in fact, that very act of remembering, of retrieving those details, alters the way you'll be able to remember that memory in the future. So there's been this, this wonderful series of studies um, called retrieval-induced forgetting, which is the phenomenon, which is this, this, this finding that, um, let's say you have you know, eight things that you need to remember. And um, four of them are in one category, say like fruits, and the other four are in another category, say like drinks. Right? And you want to remember all of these words. So what they did in these studies is they would say, OK, well, I want you to practice two of the fruits um, over and over and over again. Ignore the other two fruits, and don't practice the drinks. And you'd think, OK, well, they practiced the two fruits, so they got those right. Um, and then they probably got an equal number of right answers from the drinks and the, non f the other two fruits, right? This seems logical. Um, but in, in fact, they did get the two fruits that they practiced right. The drinks, they got you know, a certain number of baseline right. But they actually remembered the two fruits that they didn't practice much less. It was called retrieval-induced forgetting. So if you remember only certain aspects of an event, you're actually harming your ability to remember other aspects of the event in the future. And you can imagine the situations in which this is really critical, like in, when uh, police officers are um, interviewing witnesses. The, more, the way that they interview the witnesses is going to affect how, what the witness is going to be able to remember in the future. So they've actually applied this retrieval and forgetting work to eyewitness uh, testimony and eyewitness interviews. And now, um, in fact, in, in particularly a lot of this work was done in the UK, they've completely changed the way the uh, police officers interview their subjects so that they don't you know, include this retrieval and forgetting component. So every time we remember, we alter the trace. And we, we affect the way that we can remember in the future. And that's why I talk about remembering is really it's constructive. You know, you build up your, 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 your building and, you know, according to a particular scaffold every time you remember, and then you tear it down, and then you chip off another piece and so that it changes. And over time, and with each retelling, you know, you're going to remember it slightly differently. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, as we get older, we often have stories that we think, you know, we tell, and they're, they're great stories, and we've told them a million times, and they're usually the ones that are the least accurate. So when you go back and listen to, or, you know, like there's this one radio, I think it was a radio lab or this American Life episode of this guy who had this memory of, of um, you know, having this confrontation with his dad at a particular time. And, uh, you know, he had this really vivid memory of standing up to his dad. And, you know, so it was like a turning point in his life. And he's told this story a million times. And then when he went back and, you know, he actually found there were transcripts. His dad had taped the conversation. And he listened back to this conversation that he, he remembered like it was yesterday nothing like he remembered it. And you know, we do this all the time. It's like, well, we think we totally remember it. And you know, we don't. It's a good story. But do you think that's the main reason that we, because I know that the more you remember a memory, the, the more off it gets from reality. Does, do you think that's the main reason, maybe, it's because we? Because we retell it? Um, yeah, I mean, there is, there is also you know, forgetting. And as you change, as you're, as you're, as you're you know, as your, as your personality, your beliefs, your life changes, you know, different things become important to you. So when you go back to try to remember something, you know, you might remember different details. But I, I, I do think that the best way to preserve a memory in terms of its accuracy is probably to never think about it. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, that, that's, that, there's, there's the, the problem, too, of, well, over time, you know, things do get forgotten. Um, and yet, some, some memories flood back to you with the right cues. You know, you, you just, as I mentioned, you go back to your middle school and all of a sudden you remember all these things you didn't remember before in much more vivid detail than if you had sat at home and practiced remembering it you know, every night for the last 10 years. Yeah. Is that also maybe because like, when you were talking about the hippocampus, uh, you said that <coughs> it, it is also like one of the few parts of the brain where new brain matter can be produced. So that when you are remembering the memory, like it's affected by what you're feeling then, and so like when that new brain matter is produced, like it's affected by how you're feeling then when you remember it. So that's why it also like overrides the actual factual details of the memory.
That's a really good question. And I think that the answer is we don't know yet. I mean, I suspect the way that your current state of mind affects your remembering is more of a prefrontal cortical function rather than a medial temporal lobe function necessarily, um, because your, your prefrontal cortex is the one that's really involved in sort of, you know, your, in your decision making and, and, and a lot of the things that sort of affect the way you, um, the way you view the world. Uh, but, but, you know, it's certainly possible that, yeah, you know, you do have this neurogenesis in the dentate gyrus, and does that actually change? I mean, you know, I, I, think, I think probably the, the dent, that, that part of the brain has a sort of simpler function. It's an older part of the brain, um, you know, and I, and I suspect it sort of, you know, I, yeah, I would, I would think it's, it's probably an interaction, and that's kind of a, a, a sort of a, a not very... Um, satisfying but probably more true answer is that it's, it's probably a combination of you know the way your frontal cortex is is now wired and the way it's querying information from your medial temporal lobe. I'm sorry but we, we actually have to leave the room in like five minutes. Oh okay. <laughs> so maybe I mean there's just too many questions you can take one more but we have to stop after that for sure. Okay. So. One more question who's got the best one you've already had a few so. How about you? Um, is that interaction similarly an explanation for the relationship between um, recall and spatial relationships being processed both by the hippocampus, or is there another like evolutionary reason or story that? Yeah, no. I mean, I so I, I think you know I think when it comes to spatial navigation and its relationship to recollection, I think that really is hippocampal based or entorhinal cortex based or medial temporal lobe based. I mean, I really do think there's some kind of special relationship there, and I think part of it comes from the fact that you know we we share a lot of genetic material and our brains are very similar to things like rodents for whom space is extremely important, and um, you know we see their you know their their equivalent of the hippocampus is is extremely active in different parts of space. That's really a, lo a lot of what it does. Um, so. I think that that's one of the ways in which, you know, I, I see in, in some ways the spatial um, navigation as an analog to creating associations in many different ways, right? We might start understanding space and its locations and, you know, we think about navigation as not just, um, okay, a particular location, but rather that location in relation to where we are, where we want to go, where we've been, etc. So I think that that's maybe even part of the the, the sort of the, the scaffolding that allows us to make other kinds of associations. You know, we first start by sort of understanding spatial relationships literally in space, and then we can kind of apply that same um, you know framework to creating relationships between um, events and you know between things that happen to us. So that's what I think. That's probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well thanks everyone for coming.